Okay, you're, are you more or less ready? Okay. Let me just look at this and think about it for a minute. Okay. In his lecture on Monday, Stirl uh, taught us a great deal about the phenomenology of massive black holes in galactic nuclei, about uh, the and the phenomenology of what happens when galac galaxies uh, collide and merge. The black holes from the two cores of the two galaxies uh, sink to the center of the merged galaxy, find each other, form a binary. Uh, and then we have the possibility of gravitational wave emission by this uh, binary made of supermassive black holes. And so today I want to begin by talking about the gravitational waves from such binaries and their detectability. I'm showing here the Lisa noise curve plotted as a function of frequency going from 10 to the minus 4 hertz up to 1 tenth of a hertz. So these are periods of Min of seconds uh, to hours. Plotted vertically is the square root of the spectral density of the uh, gravitational wave noise of the detector, a quantity that we will learn uh, more about in a sophisticated uh, uh, sense from the theory of random processes next term, but a quantity that you have dealt with before. And as you recall, this is uh, something which has dimensions of uh, dimensionless gravity wave strain or gravity wave field per square root of hertz. And you are to multiply this by the square root of the bandwidth over which you collect a signal in frequency in order to get the uh, signal uh, strength, uh, or, or in order to get the noise that uh, that signal must deal with. I'm plotting in this graph, which graph comes from the uh, paper by uh, Kurt Cutler and myself that's on the course website, a recent review article on gravitational wave sources. I'm plotting the sources in a different way relative to the noise curve uh, than we do for LIGO. The height of the sources above the noise curve in the LISA case is just equal to the signal and noise ratio that you would get if you integrate up the signal over a frequency band uh, uh, during which uh, the signal sweeps through, a, uh, through the frequency band delta f equal to f. So that, for example, sweeping uh, from uh, 10 to the minus 3 hertz to 2 times 10 to the minus 3 hertz, you build up a, a, a net signal and noise ratio if you're doing optimal signal processing. And that signal to noise ratio, net sig signal strength that you build up in that way, divided by uh, the RMS noise in the LISA band, in that frequency band, is the height above this curve. And so, in order to really believe any signal that you see, you need a signal to noise ratio, in the case of LISA, of perhaps five. And so, you need to have this signal about a factor of five above the noise curve. But in fact, for these massive black hole binaries, uh, the signal strengths are much more than a factor of five above the Lisa noise curve. Uh, they, uh, in the case of two 10 to the four solar mass black holes spiraling together, you have a signal to noise ratio that may be something like 100. In the case of two 10 to the five solar mass black holes, you're getting up close to 1,000. Two 10 to the six solar mass black holes it's getting up uh, toward uh, a number of thousands, uh, maybe 10,000 in signal noise ratio and so forth. Uh, let me just remind you about the Lisa noise curve that at uh, low frequencies we have noise due to stochastic forces acting on the spacecraft. At higher frequencies we have shot noise and we'll learn all about that next term. Now, and then we also have noise due to uh, white dwarf binaries which uh, Stirl talked about. Now returning to the uh, signals from the inspiraling binaries. I'm showing here the signal uh, uh, at a, a point which is one year before the final merger of these two 10 to the 5 solar mass black holes, one month before the final merger, and one day before the final merger. So you notice that uh, in the period that it takes about one uh, of order one day to sweep through here, you build up about as much signal as you take in order to go a few months from here to there. Uh, so you get roughly equal amounts of signal 
over the entire uh, frequency band uh, as you sweep from the low frequencies to the high. Now, uh, if you have a massive black hole binary is above t uh, two, ten to the two uh, black holes that have masses of 10 to the 6 solar masses, they, you can just extrapolate up here. They will be up there for 10 to the 7, up here for 10 to the 8. But by the time you get down to frequencies below uh, 10 to the minus 4 hertz, we have no confidence at all in this Lisa noise curve. And we probably won't be able to pick up uh, and really believe any signals that we get much below 10 to the minus 4 hertz. So the bottom line is that we should be able to see the in-spiral of uh, massive black hole binaries with very high signal and noise ratios up to a few times 10 to the 7 solar masses with LISA, but it will be problematic to see anything more massive than that because the uh, waves will be uh, pushed down to such low frequencies that the noise will probably rise very sharply down here uh, due to not having a good enough isolation system on the spacecraft, and we just won't be able to see it. Um, uh, next week, uh, Mark Scheel will give a lecture and talk about the merger waves that come at the end point of the end spiral down here. Today I want to talk about the waves coming uh, from the end spiral itself. So let me turn this off and go to the blackboard. Okay. So, the issue then is the details of the waves from, from supermassive black hole uh, binaries. And as we saw, in terms of signal strengths, we should be able to observe the waves uh, when the black holes have masses of 10 to the 4 solar masses, or 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, probably not 10 to the 8. And so let's talk about what we learned from Stirl's lecture last week about these various mass ranges, beginning with uh, masses less than 10 to the 6th solar masses and going on up. And as we learned from Stirl uh, uh, on Monday, for masses less than 10, than 10 to the 6th solar masses, we don't know what the event rate is going to be. The reason is because we don't know how many massive black holes there are in galactic nuclei in this mass range. I re re remind you that the uh, supermassive black hole in our own galaxy has a mass of uh, something like 3 million solar masses just uh, up above this mass range, and we know about that. We know about a few other black, massive black holes that are around 10 to the 6 solar masses. But when you go to masses below 10 to the 6 solar masses, uh, you just don't have the observational data. And the reason was, as you may recall, that when you get to these smaller masses, you have a smaller cusps in the rise of the stellar uh, dispersion uh, in the spectra from the uh, electromagnetic waves from around the black, from the, from the stars around the black hole. The uh, size physically of the stellar cusp is going to scale as the mass of the black hole. You go to smaller mass black holes, and you have a smaller cusp and uh, you can't see the cusp, you don't have enough angular resolution with the Hubble Space Telescope to see the cusp out to uh, large enough distances to have any more galaxies uh, in your field of view than our own galaxy, and our own galaxy doesn't happen to get down into this mass range. Uh, and so it may, however, very well be that there are large numbers of massive black holes in this mass range. Stirl described hierarchical scenarios for uh, supermassive black hole formation based on cold dark matter uh, ideas in which you would get, if those ideas are right, a, a large number of uh, black hole binaries in that mass range. But that's speculation. We have no observational data to tell us about it. Does yeah. that mass range, does it have to be in galactic cores in these lower supermassive? Uh, it would not have to be. It's a question of, of astrophysical scenarios. And so you may form things up to maybe a thousand solar masses, maybe a little larger and bother clusters through hierarchical processes. But I don't know where you're going to get things up above a few thousand solar masses, except in galactic nuclei. The bother clusters you get up to a few thousand, miles, perhaps. Um, so, uh, but if you look at the range of order 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 solar masses, 
that's where uh, we have observational data uh, and where also the theory suggests that uh, uh, when uh, galaxies such as our galaxy and another galaxy merge, the black holes will sink and find themselves and actually merge in less than the age of the universe. And so we have some confidence about what the numbers are in there, and that's what Stirl talked about. And the bottom line is the various estimates that are made in that in there range from 0.1 per year to about 100 per year. About 100 per year. So there's maybe a factor of 1,000 uncertain, even that's pretty good uh, in this business. Uh, that's an interesting event rate in the sense that uh, even if you uh, don't see the final mergers in the lower uh, end, you might see things, see binary black holes that are headed towards the final merger, but you don't see it this year, you would have to wait uh, 10 years or five years to see it. Um, and when you go above 10 to the 8, above 10 to the 7 solar masses, if you look back at that curve, you basically shove the uh, end spiral waves down to such low frequencies that least it is unlikely to be able to see them. So this is the really interesting case in the sense that we have some handle on event rate right, through the process that Stroll talked about. That's a uh, very interesting uh, but involves speculation, so the event rate could be quite high. And, uh, looking at these could teach us a lot about structure formation and what goes on in, in, uh, in the uh, building up of massive black holes. Now, because the signal to noise ratios are so strong, and I showed you signal to noise ratios uh, in that graph. Uh, for uh, sources at a distance of a uh, cosmological redshift of about one. Because those signal to noise ratios are so high, that means you can see these to, uh, to redshifts large compared to one, out to basically the very beginning of structure formation, which was a, a redshift of 10 or maybe even as far as 30, that you might have uh, started to form some of these things. Uh, and so it's important in thinking about the gravitational waves to pay attention to cosmological effects on the frequencies and the amplitudes of the waves. So I want to briefly discuss that then. I imagine I have some source, two black holes orbiting each other, and in the local wave zone, before you're out far enough that cosmological effects become important, we know what the gravitational wave field looks like. H plus, said, for example, H cross just differs from H plus by a different uh, uh, dependence on the inclination angle of the binary of the line of sight. It looks like 2 times 1 plus cosine squared uh, iota, or maybe we called that theta uh, earlier, where theta is the inclination angle to the line of sight. So if you see it face on, theta is 0. If you see it edge on, the binary edge on, theta is uh, pi over 2. So you get the strongest waves if you see them uh, face on. Um, times mu over m. Uh, where mu is the reduced mass, m was the total mass. Uh, I'm sorry, mu over r times pi m f to the two thirds uh, times uh, cosine of two pi f t, where f then is the instantaneous frequency, and f is uh, increasing with uh, time as a result of inspire, it's chirping, we say, as the frequency rises as a result of inspire. So mu is the reduced mass, and m was the total mass. In the case of equal mass binaries, mu would be one fourth of the mass, mass of an individual uh, black hole, and that would be twice the mass of an individual black hole. One fourth, m two, no, it would be m one, m two, it would be m1 squared uh, over uh, 2m1. So it would be one half uh, for mu, and the total would be uh, 2m1. So mu would be one half of m1, and, uh, and m would be 2m1, where m1 is the mass of one of the black holes. So the total mass would differ from the reduced mass by a factor of one fourth, which is the factor that Alessandra Guanano used in her lecture last time. Um, and I talk always then in terms of reduced mass and total mass. Now, the uh, 
fact that these waves are propagating from the very early universe, rather early universe to us today, means that they are gravitationally redshifted. So I'm going to go in here and note that this F that we're talking about is the emission frequency. Uh, and, uh, and this is times the emission time. And up here, uh, this F is the emission frequency as well. Because this is uh, what we're talking about in the local wave zone. So. <laughs> <laughs> You were undressing. <laughs> Doesn't make a very good pickpocket, does it? <laughs> no, 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 uh, when the waves reach Earth, so at Earth, where the observer is, uh, the time as measured at Earth, uh, and the time uh, and the emission time differ by, well, let me write it, T emission equal to 1 plus. The shifting of and the observation. So that means that I can go in and up here where I have T emission, and aside from an additive constant that just has to do with uh, basically the, the time that it takes for the light to travel from the source to the Earth, um, I can replace T emission by this expression. And so I have that H plus is equal to 2 times 1 plus cosine squared theta mu over r pi m f emission times the cosine of 2 pi f emission becomes uh, 1 plus z f emission times the time as measured on Earth, the observation time, plus uh, some arbitrary constant, some arbitrary phase shift. Uh, no. This is the ob observed frequency. So the observed frequency is larger by 1 plus z times the emitted frequency. Oh, there's a pi m up to the 2 thirds there. Yeah, OK. So the observed frequency is 1 plus z times the emitted frequency. z is the, co is the cosmological redshift. And that's just, if, if you wish, that's the definition of z. Uh, it's it's uh, such that the observed frequencies are 1 plus z times the emitted frequencies. And so we now have the time dependence expressed in terms of uh, time as measured at Earth. That means that we never really directly measure the emission frequency. All we measure is the observed frequency. And we typically will not know what the redshift is. Uh, at least not directly from the observations. We may infer it indirectly by means that I'll talk about, but not directly from the observations. And since we uh, don't necessarily know what the redshift is, we don't know the emission frequency, all we know is the observation frequency, I want to re-express the stuff out in front in terms of the observation frequency. Um, and so the Observation frequency, just a second, I've got that. The observed frequency is lower than the emission, than the emitted frequency, so this should, 1 plus z should be to the minus 1. Okay, so do I have that wrong up here? This is to the minus 1. That's fine. So it's 1 plus z to the minus 1 times, okay. Oh, damn. Let's go back here and do it right, okay? So we have that F observed is equal to 1 uh, over 1 plus Z times F emitted. And we have that T observed is equal to 1 plus Z 
times T emitted. So that the product of F observed times T observed is the same as F emitted times T emitted. That is, they redshift in the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, and the observed frequency is lower than the emitted frequency. And so this is cosine 2 pi F observed T observed. And F observed T observed is the same th thing as F emitted times T emitted. Okay. Okay, so then up in here, I don't I want to get rid of F, F emitted, the emitted frequency, because that's not something that I can see. I can only measure the ticking rate of the observed time at Earth, and so I can only infer the observed frequency, and so I want to write the amplitude in terms of the observed frequency. If I do that, then this F emitted becomes 1 plus Z times F observed, and so this expression becomes pi M F, uh, or pi M times 1 plus Z F observed goes in there. Okay. Now the product mu times M to the 2 thirds, which is the product that I have in here, is just a power of the chirp mass. Recall the chirp mass is mu to the 3 fifths, m to the 2 fifths. And so mu m to the 2 thirds is just a power of the chirp mass. And so I can also go in here and I can rewrite this whole thing in terms of the chirp mass. This just becomes chirp mass here, and that m becomes chirp mass there. So I claim that chirp mass over R times pi chirp mass F to the two-thirds is the same as mu over R times pi times total mass to the uh, times F to the two-thirds. Okay. Um, and so uh, what I then have inside this expression is the, uh, the observed mass times the chirp mass. I'm, so, I'm sorry, the observed frequency times the chirp mass so I would also like to write this up here in terms of times 1 plus z. So what I'm really inferring in here is 1 plus z times chirp mass from this expression. So I want to express that also in terms of 1 plus z times chirp mass. And so I can do that by multiplying the top and the bottom by 1 plus z. So that has those factors brought into a form that I'm going to want. I'll collect everything together in a moment. But I need to worry about the 1 over R behavior, because this 1 over R was 1 over R uh, in the local wave zone, but cosmological effects are going to change what I mean by 1 over R when I get to large radii. But this waveform has the rapidly oscillating phase part, which is what I have in here that I've dealt with. And the amplitude, we know the amplitude should really die out as 1 over the square root of the cross-sectional area of a bundle of rays. We know in general that uh, the amplitude of the waves dies out as 1 over cross-sectional area of a bundle of rays in the geometric optics approximation. And then it oscillates uh, with the phase oscillation. And the phase oscillation is basically carried along the rays, conserved uh, along the rays but oscillates very rapidly from one ray to another. We've already dealt with the phase oscillations. We haven't dealt with the, uh, uh, fully with uh, how uh, the waves die off with distance. And so this 1 over R factor, in the near zone, this is the square root of the cross-sectional area, uh, I'm sorry, in the local wave zone, cross-sectional area of some bundle of rays. What bundle of rays? Well, this is a spherically symmetric situation. And uh, the rays I'm concerned about go out from the source, uh, subtending some uh, angle, some solid angle around the source. And, if I, uh, and so the cross-sectional area, then, uh, uh, is something that, uh, that is a cross-sectional area of a bundle of rays uh, that, uh, that uh, are spherically symmetric, subtending some solid angle, and they just continue to subtend the same solid angle as they go out through the universe. 
And so the R that I want to have appear here is the cross-sectional area of that bundle of rays that subtends a unit solid angle. So you can use cosmological theory, cosmological models, to figure out what that R is. That R is what is called by cosmologists proper motion distance. And proper motion distance is, just by definition, it's the uh, square root of the cross-sectional area subtended by a bundle of rays going out in a spherically symmetric situation uh, away from their source. Okay. So I'm going to put a subscript PM on here for proper motion distance. And then I have uh, the final answer that h plus is equal to 2 times 1 plus cosine squared, uh, the inclinational angle. I have chirp mass times 1 plus z divided by the proper motion distance times 1 plus z. Then I have pi times chirp mass times 1 plus z, f uh, observed the two-thirds, I have the cosine of 2 pi f observed, t observed. So it's evident then from this expression that what we should be able to measure, that what we should be able to learn about from the observations of the gravitational waves, if we have no other information, we can measure F observed, we can measure the chirp mass times 1 plus z. And in fact, if you go through the details, and I'm going to give you an exercise on this, the chirp mass times 1 plus z actually comes out, out of the in-spiral rate. And so if you look at the in-spiral rate, which is not embodied in here, you have to go on and look at the time rate of change of frequency. And then you measure an in-spiral weight rate, and that gives you chirp mass times 1 plus z. And then knowing chirp mass times 1 plus z, knowing h plus and h cross, which depends in a different way on the inclination angle, uh, the ra their ratio will give you the inclination angle. So you get the inclination angle from uh, the ratio of h plus to h cross, everything else is the same in the two in terms of amplitude. So that gives you the inclination angle. And uh, knowing inclination angle, chirp mass times 1 plus z, you can uh, get the proper motion distance times 1 plus z. And so these are the things that are observable uh, from this signal. The proper motion distance times 1 plus z, for those who know cosmology, er, terminology, is what's called the luminosity distance. And so we learn the observed frequency from the oscillations, from the in-spiral rate, we learn the chirp mass times 1 plus z uh, from, the, uh, from the ratio of the amplitudes of the two polarizations, uh, we learn the inclination angle, and then uh, from the uh, overall amplitude of the waves, we learn the proper motion distance times 1 plus z, which is the luminosity distance. So those are the things that we get out of the observations. If we look at the post-Newtonian corrections that uh, Alessandra talked about last week, then we can get the individual masses as well, but not surprisingly, and this will be an exercise for you, you get m1 times 1 plus z and m2 times 1 plus z. And so you can never directly uh, measure uh, off of these gravitational wave observations alone. You cannot directly measure the masses, but you can uh, get the masses times 1 plus z, you cannot directly measure the proper motion distance, but you get the proper motion distance times 1 plus z, or the luminosity distance. Those are the things, then, that you infer from, from the in-spiral waves. Okay. Um, okay. Now, it's worth knowing how is a function of redshift, because we're talking about doing observations that might go out as far as a redshift of 30. As a function of z, what does the proper motion distance look like? And what does the luminosity distance look like? 
Well, of course, both of them start out looking like the same thing, increasing linearly with, uh, uh, linearly with z. So this would be 0, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4. Proper motion distance goes up in asymptotes to a fixed value. The reason is very simple. If you imagine having a source that's in the early universe, and it's uh, emitting when the universe is, say, 1 billion years old, but we live in the universe when it's 15 billion years old, say. Uh, the cross-sectional area of a bundle of rays that have headed out from there over those 14 billion years since then, it'll have a, some given size. But if you emit the waves uh, from when the universe, instead of being one billion years old, was half a billion years old, so the rays travel for a total time of 14.5 billion years instead of 14 billion years, the cross-sectional area of that bundle of rays is not going to be very much bigger than it was in the first case. We traveled for only a, a tiny, tiny fractional in, uh, increase in distance, but that corresponds to a rather big difference in redshift. And so it's uh, for that reason the proper motion distance flattens out, whereas the uh, luminosity distance rises and keeps going linearly since luminosity distance goes as a proper motion distance times 1 plus z, it's got to keep going linearly. It'll have some curvature in here, but then wind up going linearly in the end. Now, the overall strength of the waves in terms of h, it goes as 1 over proper motion distance. Uh, well, I put a 1 plus z in the numerator and a 1 plus z in the denominator, but I only did that because I wanted to talk about what is it that we actually can measure, what can we infer from the observed waves. And it's luminosity distance we infer from the observed waves, but it's really proper motion distance that determines how strong the waves are when they reach the Earth. So the waves, as you uh, go to larger and larger redshifts, the waves get redshifted. The observed frequency gets uh, lower and lower. But the overall amplitude of the waves just doesn't change much for the same source as you go out to larger and larger and larger redshifts. And so that basically means that you can really see these sources that have these very large signal-to-noise ratios uh, uh, at one at a redshift of unity. You really can see them out to redshifts of 10 or 30 just fine. Okay. Any questions? Okay, then I want to uh, switch over to my second topic, which is the gravitational waves from small bodies uh, spiraling into massive black holes. Um, and so Sterl also discussed to a, a small degree this issue uh, at the end of his lecture. And he noted that, uh, and I'll probably give you an exercise on this, that uh, if you have black holes in the mass range that we can see the waves uh, uh, to, uh, the, for which we can see the waves, uh, and let, let me say that the, the wave frequency, uh, which depended on the total mass uh, in the previous uh, diagram, as you make the total mass bigger and bigger and bigger, the uh, wave frequency goes down because it takes a, a longer characteristic time for the binary to go around and around. And similarly, if, if you have a small object spiraling into a massive black hole, the bigger the mass of this black hole, the uh, uh, lower the frequency of the waves has to be if uh, the uh, object orbiting goes down within, let's say, 10 Schwarzschild radii of the black hole, 10, 10 uh, 5 horizon radii. As you make the black hole more and more massive, these distances become larger in proportion to the mass, and so the wave frequencies go down inversely with the mass. And so uh, the bigger black hole, uh, the, the uh, if you in spiral into a more and more massive black hole, you wind up with waves that are at lower and lower frequencies. And so, and the numbers are roughly the same as uh, in the case of uh, two in spiraling black holes, since in the two in spiraling black holes I had equal masses, and some of the masses was within a factor of two the same as the mass of an individual black hole. Basically, the numbers are roughly the same. 
And the bottom line is that uh, we can see stuff uh, spiraling into and near the horizon of uh, black holes where the mass of the black hole, which I'm now going to call M, is in the range, say, 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 solar masses. But uh, below this, uh, the waves are going to be shoved to a high enough frequency and are going to be hard and weak enough that you can't see it. And above 10 to the solar masses, uh, they're shoved to such a low frequency that you can't see the waves. And so the black hole mass in the range 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 solar masses is what we want to think in terms of. And 10 to the 6 solar masses is more or less optimal. And uh, the inspiraling object has got to be a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a small black hole. If it were a, any other kind of a star, the star would be sufficiently large for this mass of the big black hole that it would be torn apart long before it nears the horizon of the big black hole, be tidally disrupted. And that's what I will give you an exercise on, is, is, uh, is uh, for what masses of big black holes would uh, uh, normal-sized stars be torn apart uh, before they get in the vicinity of the horizon? Um, and for what masses uh, do you have, uh, I'm sorry, for what si masses of big black holes will normal stars get torn apart? And uh, is it true, indeed it is, that throughout this mass range, white dwarfs, well, white dwarfs will get torn apart at the lower end of this mass range, but they get very close to the horizon before they get torn apart. Uh, neutron stars, small black holes will never get torn apart in this, uh, in this mass range. Okay. Um, now, I want to show you the signal to noise ratios uh, for stuff then, white dwarfs, neutron stars, and small mass black holes spiraling into uh, supermassive black holes. With supermassive black hole, mass is in that range of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 solar masses. And I've just picked one specific set of numbers from which you can scale things. Um, and that's a set of numbers where my big black hole is 10 to the 6 solar masses. And uh, I have a 10 solar mass black hole spiraling in. And it, I have sh I'm showing you two examples. One is where the big black hole is spinning rapidly. So it's described by a Kerr metric, a Kerr solution to the Einstein equations. The other is where the big black hole is not spinning at all. In the case where the big black hole is spinning rapidly, uh, in the last year, the waves uh, move from a frequency of about uh, uh, 30 hertz on up to about, uh, I, I'm sorry, a frequency of, 30, of, uh, of 3 millihertz on up to about 30 millihertz. So it, it sweeps through a fairly big frequency band. And then as the uh, small black hole plunges in the big black hole, the signal strength falls. Pardon? So three three millihertz is uh, a period of about uh, three hundred seconds. So it's about five minutes. Okay. So a five minute period up to uh, a tenth that. So a half a minute period. This is one year before the end, and the number of cycles left in the uh, wave train is roughly 180,000. It's in one month before the end and one day before the end. Well, I've forgotten the numbers, but one day before the end is a few thousand cycles left in the wave train. Um, the signal to noise ratios are pretty big in this case, signal to noise ratio of 100. If the big black hole is not spinning at all, then you do not sweep through very much uh, a range of frequency at all. Uh, one year before the, the end, you're here. One day before the end, you're there. One, uh, I'm sorry, one month, you're here. And one day, you're there. So the spin of the black hole has a tremendous influence. That influence arises primarily because the ISCO that, uh, that Alessander talked about, the innermost stable circular orbit, for a rapidly spinning black hole, it's at a far smaller circumference by a factor of six than for a non-spinning black hole. And so there's a very big difference in the 
uh, and it's, if, they, if the black hole spins very fast, then the in-spiraling object can get very close to the horizon in terms of circumference uh, before it starts to plunge, before it reaches the ISCO and falls in. And your ability to detect it is really dominated by when it's far away, because that's when you get the most great Well, the signal-to-noise ratio is about the same. This is, this is plotted at a height such that the signal-to-noise ratio uh, is this height, where the signal-to-noise ratio is what you build up as you sweep through delta f equal to f. So if I'm, and delta f equal to f is about that much. So in sweeping from here to there, you get a signal-to-noise ratio of about 100. From there to there, signal-to-noise ratio of maybe 90 or 80. And so it's really, in fact, turns out that uh, although you have more cycles out, uh, although you have more cycles out here, you uh, have a weaker signal, and they more or less balance in, in signal noise ratio. Pardon? Yeah. So they more or less balance in signal noise ratio. Now, what I want you to remember uh, is the number. 10 solar mass into 10 to the 6 solar masses, we have a signal noise ratio that could be roughly 100. So that's very promising um, at first sight. So that's what I will talk about. Okay. Okay. So some numbers. So this is a 10 solar mass from mu. The total mass, the mass of the big black hole uh, is 10 to the 6 solar masses. The signal to noise ratio is about 100. Uh, if we do optimal signal processing, which, and we'll talk about precisely what optimal signal processing means, Next term. But in order to do optical signal processing, you need to know in advance what the waveform is uh, to within about a radian over the whole uh, sweep of the signal. Now, for reasons that I'll explain in a few minutes, it's unlikely we'll be able to do optimal signal processing for these sources. And as a result, we're going to lose in signal and noise. We don't know how much we're going to lose. Um, but my personal guess is we may lose as much as a factor of 20. That's a guess. And I could be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm very wrong. But uh, could lose, Kip speculates. A factor 20 in the signal to noise ratio. So that means, if that were the case, that the signal to noise ratio we're dealing with is about 5. Now, 5 is good enough that you believe what you see, but only sort of barely. Because these signals last for a whole year instead of only lasting for a few seconds or a few minutes as in the LIGO case, you don't need nearly as big a signal to noise ratio to be confident in the LISA case as you need in the, in the uh, uh, LIGO case. Uh, so five should be adequate. So after you've counted for that, Yeah, that's uh, including the total signal to noise ratio that you, that you may build up. Okay. Now let's talk about rates. For these sources, and then I keep for that I appeal back to Stirl's talk again last week. So uh, if you follow the uh, population synthesis calculations that Mark Freitag has been doing uh, uh, here at, at Caltech, uh, those population synthesis calculations are population synthesis basically for the evolution of a cluster of stars around a massive black hole, not for the evolution of a binary, binary black hole systems. But you look at Mark Freitag's calculations, and he computes then uh, for what we think are the kinds of conditions you would have around one of these massive black holes. 
he computes in the end uh, the rate at which uh, a compact objects, primarily uh, black holes that may be 10 solar masses, get swallowed by the big black hole. Uh, and uh, then you extrapolate out through the universe, and so uh, the tail end of this analysis is, is done by Finney, built based on uh, uh, Mark's uh, simulations. They will give us then for um, the case of 10 solar masses going into 10 to the 6 solar masses, they will give us an event rate of 1 to 10 per year, which is very nice. So we feel good. But if we lose this factor 20 in signal to noise ratio, and it's at the lower end of that, or even a little below the end of that, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, that's 1 to 10 per year at what distance? I didn't write it down, but I think it's out to 1 gigaparsec, out to the 3 gigaparsecs that I had in the, uh, in the diagram. So I was working at a distance of three gigaparsecs. That is out to a, out to something like a cosmological redshift of order unity. Um, now, uh, but they may have it at one gigaparsec. I've forgotten. But, but the bottom line is that if these numbers are right, we're probably okay. But this depends on the modeling, on the correctness of Mark Freitag's modeling. And uh, if that is not giving the correct answers, uh, we could be in bad trouble. Bad in the sense that Lisa may not see this source. Now, as I will explain, the glory of this source is this is a source that will enable us to explore the space-time geometry in the immediate vicinity of a massive black hole with very high precision. So we really want this source. So the... Uh, LISA International Science Team, which basically oversees uh, LISA from a science point of view, of which uh, 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 Tom Prince is a co-chair, the American co-chair, and uh, uh, Sterl uh, and I and Prince are members of it. We met in Italy in December. And we faced up to the issue of this source and the possibility that Finney and Freitag are wrong. And we agreed that they should explore making LISA more sensitive by a factor of four than the current design and see how much it costs because we're afraid of losing this source otherwise. So this source drives the uh, LISA noise curve. And making it a factor of four or more sensitive uh, means scaling up the telescope uh, that collimates the beam and or uh, increasing the laser light power. There are a number of things you can do uh, that, uh, in order to do this, and you would do, do some combination of these things in order to uh, really achieve this improved sensitivity, but we don't know how much it's going to cost, and that's being costed out. In the meantime, because the least of specifications need to be frozen by a year from this coming December, in the meantime, there is going to be, I hope, a very strong effort to try to pin down how much loss of signal and noise ratio there is. There will be another problem, and that is the problem of uh, digging the waves from individual ones of these sources out from the background that is caused by all the other sources of this sort and by white dwarf binaries and everything else. That, again, is a signal processing issue. So both of these signal processing issues uh, are going to have to be uh, worked very hard between now and December 2003 in order for us to uh, firm up the design of LISA. And in parallel, uh, the, uh, the LISA project is going to be costing uh, the uh, more ambitious design as well as the uh, old, less ambitious design to see what the cost is. And it'll all come together in uh, December 2003. No, so there, so there are estimations by Sigurdsson and Reese, and I will give you uh, references earlier that do not rely on these sim simulations, but rely more heavily on observation than on the simulations. And they will give us a rate uh, of, um, of a few per year 
for neutron stars going into 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes. At roughly this distance, at uh, I think 1 or 3 gigaparsecs distance, I think maybe at 1 gigaparsecs distance. When you look at how the signal strength scales, when you go from 10 solar masses to uh, the neutron star, you basically lose in signal strength by a factor of 3. And this loss of a factor of 3 in signal strength is such that with the more ambitious mission, we should still be all right if these estimates, which are more nearly based on observation, than, uh, but uh, not by any means fully based on observation. Uh, if, if these uh, are right, uh, but uh, Finney and Freitag are wrong, we are okay with the, more advan with the more ambitious version of LISA, but we would not be okay with uh, uh, LISA, uh, with the uh, original version of LISA, and the loss of signal and noise that I'm speculating. So there are really three issues that need to be understood as best we can by December 2003. One is the event rates. We have these two different uh, uh, estimates um, arrived at in different ways. The event rates, the loss of signal and noise due to not being able to do optimal signal processing, and the loss of signal and noise uh, due to uh, the difficulty of finding the signals uh, in the background of other sources. And all three have gotten.